Good evening, I'm Casey Nolan. Because of tonight's topic, crimes are committed, communities suffer, and families mourn. We are talking about the ugly topic of heroin in the St. Louis region, but there is hope. Our community is starting to fight back, so stay tuned. He came and his friends was doing it. So I asked him for some one day, and he gave it to me. Most of it is, it's an off-white powder, granular, almost have a brown tinge to it. The heroin epidemic's getting outrageous. Seems to be the drug of choice right now. They get on it and they're stealing from their parents, they're robbing their neighbors, whatever they have to do to get that money, they get that fix. This drug doesn't discriminate, doesn't care who you are, where you came from. It has one goal in mind, that's to kill you. Nobody wants to be a heroin addict. This is really about addiction. ago you wouldn't have seen anything like this. Not a rally about this issue, not here. But heroin has come to Wentzville. Uh, there was another heroin overdose on October 17th. I just had two in uh, Flint Hill uh, uh, last evening. So it's out there and I'm trying to just bring awareness to it and, and get it out of my city. Tim Ramshaw and his family never thought they'd be standing on a street corner to raise awareness about heroin use. They certainly never thought they'd be affected by it either. We're not sure how it started. I think she just got caught up in the wrong crowd. And uh, it was new to us. I mean, we didn't know until they knocked on our door and let us know she was gone. Ramshaw's 18-year-old daughter, Megan, overdosed on heroin just six months ago. A beautiful young woman who didn't fit the mold of a heroin user. Would you, would you rather be a lawyer or a dope man? There was a time when this was the image of a heroin addict. It's from a 1966 KMOX TV documentary called The Corner. Before you use H, you've got to cook it. Heroin was primarily an inner city problem. But even then, it was on the fringe, even among illegal drug users. There was a stigma and a needle. Today, that's not how you start heroin. For many young people, it begins in the medicine cabinet. What we see is almost every heroin addict that I've talked to, without fail, said I started on prescription pain meds. That's what I started on. Then I was addicted, I had no choice but to continue, and that's how I got into heroin. St. Louis County Police Chief Tim Fitch has made addressing the heroin issue in his county a high priority. Because the quality of heroin had increased so much in the last few years that it re really was just killing people because they didn't know what they were getting. Here's the facts. The St. Louis region has seen a significant rise in heroin use in recent years. Today, heroin is more potent, more addictive, and cheaper than ever before. And it doesn't have to be injected with a needle. It can be smoked, swallowed, or snorted. The number of deaths in Missouri due to heroin overdoses has increased dramatically. In 2007, there were 81. In 2011, that number grew to nearly 250. It wasn't unusual for 30 years ago to see heroin at about a 10 to 15 percent purity level, and then it's cut with other things. Today, you don't know what you're getting. You could get something as high as 80 to 90 percent pure heroin. The problem is, is the five times you used it prior to that, it might have been 30 percent pure heroin. And now all of a sudden you get hit with a hot shot of 80 percent pure heroin. That's how the deaths are occurring today. She was crazy, kind of like her dad. She'd be missed by a whole bunch of people. This is a tough but important conversation that really began here at the Nine Network on Monday night with a packed and vibrant town hall. That conversation has continued throughout the week online, and we want your voice 
in tonight's program as well. Here to tell you how that happens is Ed Reggie. Ed. Thanks, Casey. Well, you actually are a critical part of tonight's conversation. Here at Stay Tuned, we want to hear from you. What can you add to the conversation? Now, there are several ways you can do this, whether you're live in the studio, like our audience tonight, or at home. You, we want you to go to the Facebook page of the Nine Network. We put a question up there earlier today. We want you to comment right under the graphic, the question. And you can also tweet your, uh, your responses, your comments to us by using the hashtag pound stay tuned STL. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you're thinking about tonight's topic. We're joined now to get this conversation really off on the right foot uh, is with Dan Duncan. Dan, you're with the National Council on Alcohol Alcoholism and Drug Abuse here in St. Louis. And I want to talk to you because I want to make sure we're, we get the, the ship out of the harbor in the right direction here tonight and, and ground us in some facts. I want to start, though, by last week. At the end of the show last week, we had some time to chat with the audience. They said, what's next week's topic? And I said, heroin. And, I, and they kind of chuckled. They didn't know that this was a serious issue current to our times. Is that uh, surprise you that maybe not everyone knows what we're up against here? No, I would like to think since we've been working so hard for the last year and a half or two years to raise awareness that everybody would have heard by now, but in fact they have not. Um, and this is an issue that if it directs you, directly impacts you or somebody close to you, you know, it, 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 obviously your awareness grows, but a lot of people think that it's not associated with their community or, or around them when in fact we're finding more and more it's just about everywhere. So. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to have this. Well, give us a real quick education, too, because m people may not know, like we saw in the piece there, it's not just a needle anymore. How, just real quickly, how else is heroin used? What does it look like? What's the situation there? Primarily, it's powdered form. It's more potent than it's ever been. Or uh, you, you smoke it? You snort it? What you, do you can smoke it or snort it. Most young people are snorting it, yeah. Okay. So that's the means, manner of ingestion. Um, unfortunately, what happens with most people who start off uh, snorting it, eventually they're introduced to the needle, and once they try that, they find that it, it's a quicker means of ingestion, quicker, more intense high. Once they get to the needle, they tend to stay to the needle, and that's when the risk of death goes up exponentially. I saw a statistic that said 90% of heroin use in the state of Missouri is in the St. Louis region. Right. Does that sound right to you, and why is that? Yeah, well, we, you know, unfortunately, uh, St. Louis has been a stop for the drug traffickers. Uh, uh, it used to be through Chicago down to St. Louis, now it's coming straight to St. Louis because there's a thriving marketplace for it here. What parts of St. Louis? It's all over. I mean, if you want to, if you want to isolate a couple areas, uh, South City, uh, uh, South County, uh, but it's in North County, it's in West County, it's in so the surrounding counties, and the demographics are changing statewide too. But we're hearing more and more uh, of so Southern Missouri getting over to um, Kansas City. They haven't had the problem that much until recently. It's spreading. We've had calls. Uh, all over the Midwest from uh, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, asking what are you guys doing in St. Louis? We want to do something similar because they're starting to see what we've been experiencing. And, and, and just give us back up for one second. When did this really pop on the radar as a, a, a huge problem in the St. Louis area? Well, we started noticing an increase in calls and, and also, of course, an increase in overdose deaths uh, throughout the community around two, 2007 or eight. But then two years ago, 2010 is when it really seemed to increase dramatically. And then it was apparent that something was really going on. And we were starting to attach the prescription painkillers uh, right along with heroin as the precedent. You know, this is what kids were using first. Then they were going into heroin. And also, if you look into their, most of these kids' background, in truth, most of them were using marijuana before they ever used the prescription painkiller. So that pathway is becoming pretty evident, pretty clear to us. 16 years old, older, younger when they're starting? Yeah, the uh, onset of age is going younger and younger over time. Uh, the average exposure now to marijuana, alcohol is around age 12. So middle school seems to be the, the time when kids are starting, they're experimenting their usage, and it increases as, as they get into high school. And, and we, going back to that black and white footage we just saw in the, the setup piece there, has the drug itself changed? Is this a different heroin? Well, you know, the Mexican cartels, everything's been about increasing potency, whether it's marijuana or, or heroin. Uh, it's a stronger, it's, it's a more purified form of heroin, uh, and so the potency has grown. So they're able to provide a, t a tremendous amount is coming into St. Louis. Um, and it's cheap and it's plentiful. So uh, when you have a demand of, of youth who are interested in trying it, 
because they've heard so much about it. Uh, it's real, really interesting how many kids have heard about the danger, but they're still curious. They still try it because they all think that this won't get a hold of them. And, and yet it's a very quick acting addiction. Is this something that people should care about if they don't have anyone in their family or in their lives that is, this is directly affecting? Is, is this something the larger community should care about? And if, and, and if not, is there, do you see more problems there? Well, I think you should, we should all care about it if for no other reason than our kids are dying. We, we had, we've had almost 500 young people die in that St. Louis area in the last two years alone. Uh, that's enough to be concerned about right there. But if you want to look at the, the uh, ripple effect, if you will, uh, it always impacts crime, as you mentioned a minute ago. Uh, as the desperation for addiction grows, the individual gets to a point where they can't score enough money easily to get the drug, so they're going to turn to uh, illicit um, behavior, stealing from family and friends first, but then they're going to reach out beyond that, maybe prostitute. Uh, so the crime rate is definitely impacted by heroin use. There's no doubt about it. Dan Duncan, we appreciate your time. Thank you for getting us started tonight. So we heard Dan talking about the age range uh, of where this problem starts and who's affected by this and how early on. So we're going to go to our Google Plus tonight. We're going to go to our first Google Hangout and we're going to dive right in and talking, talk about how this is affecting our young people. Let me do some introductions for you quickly here. The man you see on the top of the screen, this is Jude Hassan. Uh, June, uh, Jude has a website called The Suburban Junkie. Uh, he lives in the suburbs and I'll let him tell us about the, the other half of that title in just a, a little bit. Also with us tonight, uh, Joe Richardson. Uh, Joe has a very personal story to tell us that is, uh, well, Joe, we just can't thank you enough for being here because you provide a perspective that uh, no one else can. Joe lost his son uh, very recently. And also with us tonight, Sally Altman. Sally is a health and science editor, his the health and science editor with the St. Louis Beacon, our online publication here in St. Louis. And Renee, Renee Heaney is here also, uh, Renee works with the Rockwood School District. And let me just do a little bit of housekeeping and listen closely. If anyone has any music, we may be getting a little music bleed over. So if you've got your iTunes going, just give it a mute there. Otherwise, our technical staff will be on that and we'll continue our conversation uh, otherwise. Okay, so uh, moving forward. Um, right, so let's back up from the order we started in. Uh, Jude, uh, let me talk to you for a second. And, and guys, feel free to jump in when something sparks your interest here, but Jude, you have a personal uh, experience with this drug when you hear about uh, kids starting young. Tell us about your experience. Tell us what, what heroin did in your life and, and when did it start? Well, um, I started really young. I started at the age of 15. <clears throat> and like you said, I was from the suburbs and um, I began with hot like a lot of these kids nowadays are, and I was just trying to fit in. I was trying to find a social group, and I... Okay, I think, uh, all right, Jude, let me interrupt you a little bit there. I can tell you, we're having a little trouble. The, the upside to flying by the seat of our pants here is we get some folks on the program that we wouldn't otherwise, so we, we appreciate you bearing with us when the technology uh, betrays us just a little bit, but Jude was saying he started when he was 15, and I, I believe I heard you correctly, started with uh, marijuana, but let's... We'll work on the technical aspect of this for a second. And let's go back to Joe. Uh, Joe, I want to uh, start the conversation with you. Does any of what we've heard so far tonight ring true? And again, I, I can't thank you enough. And, I, and quite honestly, I can't understand how you have the strength to be here, because uh, it wasn't that long ago. Your son is uh, BJ, right? Yes, I mean, he passed away uh, three months ago. And uh, basically started out the same way June said. He started out. Uh, uh, with marijuana and alcohol, which becomes a gateway to other... All right, guys, hang on one second. This is, t this is too important not to get it right. So we're, gon we're going to take a timeout on this. We'll get our technical crew to fix the audio because all of you have a lot to add to this conversation. We don't, wanna, we don't want it to be uh, derailed here at all by technical issues. So we will come back to you in just a minute. Thank you for your time. We ask that you just hang out with us and, and, and bear with us for one second. We're going to, let's, someone else we have here that can provide some uh, perspective in addition to our live audience 
here in the studio. We also have a group of folks here that come to our table. And if you see our show on any regular basis, the, the best way to describe the folks here is a educated and engaged group of citizens here in our St. Louis community. So we, we thank you all for being uh, back here again tonight. Um, I'll just uh, start the conversation a little bit here. D is this something that uh, you knew was a problem in St. Louis? Uh, is this something that you had heard of before tonight, before we ask you to come talk about it? I remember starting to hear, or starting to read articles in the Post-Dispatch and other places about, you know, heroin overdoses in places like, well, in places west of 270, but not rural. It's, it's suburban. I had friends who lived out there, and I thought how weird that was, how out of place that seemed at the time, because that didn't seem... Heroin didn't seem like something that would be in the middle of middle class suburbia. I was completely shocked. Um, and I'd started reading articles about it as well, but I didn't know that the rates were increasing as quickly as they were in the time frame that we're talking about. And, and real quick, Barrett, I'm sorry, Barrett, Michelle, and Joe, the, the, for, for introduction purposes, I apologize. But I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I had heard about it before, but it's, it had seemed like it was only an inner city issue. Right. So it's interesting that the, 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 the uh, the issue now is getting attention on a national level. So I really want to know, um, I look at the, I question the politics surrounding the issue. Is it, an, is it an important issue because it's affecting a different demographic than it has historically? Yeah, I mean, do you question our interest level? I don't know. Are we only interested now because it's, it's, it's affecting a different group of people? I don't, is that something that crosses your mind? Definitely. I think there's more of an air of urgency around it now um, because we see upwardly mobile, middle income, upper income, Caucasian young people in the suburbs suffering from this. One of the things I thought was really weird, though, was that other states were looking to us for, you know, what they say, Wisconsin or Illinois, yeah. different mm -hmm. places were asking us, St. Louis, Missouri, what's your response to this? That, that makes me feel like we've got it much worse than a lot of places. If they're, if they're starting to turn to us and ask, how are you guys doing this, that probably uh, to me, that says we've got it worse than a lot of places. See, I, I disagree with you. I think it's been an issue that's been here, but I think people are just starting to open their eyes up to it now. You know, I was telling you guys when we were sitting around, I went to school with a lot of kids who did drugs, and they did drugs from the ages of 13 on up, but the parents did not care and they did not see. So I guess it's a question of are you really looking at the issue? Are you seeing it? Are you involved in your kids' lives? So the age doesn't surprise you? When you I mean, we heard Jude just barely. We're going to go back to him hopefully in a minute, but he... He was starting at 15, Not, and that's, that's a little old compared to what Dan was just sitting here saying, that it can be 12. as young as 12. Mm -hmm. Is that, that doesn't surprise Not you? Not at all. I went, to, I went to school with kids who started off smoking cigarettes. They went from cigarettes to doing marijuana, and it slowly trickled into different drugs, and it went on from the time they were 13 on to 18, so. But not everybody who does marijuana goes on to heroin. Exactly. I mean, are, are we, are, are, what, does that confuse you at all? Is that a question you have? I think it's interesting when, um, Dan Duncan was saying that the, the gateway of drugs seems to be prescription medication, and, and that also um, has implications in terms of the populations that we're speaking about. You don't see low-income urban children using their parents' prescription meds for you know painkillers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the gateway drugs of choice are, are different. Well, here. that speaks to access, too, mm -hmm. because low-income kids probably don't have access to health care exactly. like that, mm -hmm. whereas kids who are from you know, middle class, upper middle class, their parents have health care, so they have more readily access to, you know, the gateway drugs if they're prescription drugs. It scares me that this stuff is the, the, the prescription painkillers and the, the things that are the gateway for heroin use are not only accessible, but they're not really being monitored by, by the parents, by, by, by folks who are in charge, by the people that these kids should be listening to and respecting, like, don't, don't get into this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it worries me a lot that parents either are you know, they don't notice it, or they're willfully ignorant, or surely my kid's not doing that. That's for some. That's that's a problem for someone else's kids, not mine. What's what's going on there that they don't see this? Well, I don't think you. I mean, I don't have any kids, but I, I'd imagine it seems like some parents would not think if you have some medication in a drug cabinet, you have kids going in there taking a few pills out of it. So I think it's it's something that's easy to not see. Mm -hmm. Something that was interesting to me, um, the the method of getting high. So the fact that these kids are choosing to snort these these pills essentially or, or the the powder is is interesting as opposed to shooting up it's i think the notion that snorting is more glamorized and it's more socially acceptable than shooting up but then eventually they they get to that point junkies use needles exactly. i'm just i'm just snorting powder this isn't i can stop whenever i wanted mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. that seems yeah no, that I, doesn't add up <laughs> in my other life as a reporter for channel five i've talked to uh, drug abuse folks 
who talk about the glamour that comes with the powder uh, and that the cocaine was a celebrity drug and, and things of that nature, the powder that comes, the, the, the things that come with that, that stigma that's attached there. And then, but then you heard Dan say, people don't start out thinking they'll ever get to a needle. Um, I, that, that resonated with me, I don't know about you. Well, isn't the powder more expensive than the actual rock form? That, well, now we may be mixing drugs, but we're, 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 those are the questions we want to answer tonight for sure. But, I, but the idea that you, know, you don't start out saying, ah, I've had a rough day, I think I'll use a needle, it progresses. I, I think that's something we've probably seen in, in other areas of other people's lives in our, in our own, whatever it might be. Okay. All right, guys, we, I tell you what we have here tonight is a, an audience full. We, when we had the town hall the other night, it was overflowing with information, overflowing with people who are passionate about this topic, and we have a lot of those folks in tonight. They are on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they're, they're helping to lead the social media charge, also coming from folks at home. So let's go to a social, social media, uh, sample right now from what people are saying so far. Thank you, we'll be back. Thanks. We'd be glad to know we put our resources into our technical staff, not the hosts. So that's going to pay off for us right now, I think. But in all seriousness, let's go back to our first Google Hangout. And we have Sally Altman with the Beacon Hi. with us. Uh, Renee, uh, Renee, you work with the Rockwood School District some, and you're, you're an organizer of sorts between different agencies as well. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Well, I'm the director of a community coalition, and Rockwood School District is one of our many wonderful partners and our fiscal agent. And they seem to be out in front on this as school districts go. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But I think, okay. I, I think we, uh, we owe Joe another uh, a, a moment here because, Absolutely. Joe, we want to hear from you. And, and I think the question I asked you previously was, my gosh, thank you for being here. How are you You're here? You're welcome. How are you here? I'm here because I want to help other people. I want to educate parents, other teenagers, and anybody in the community, uh, what, can you what, we, what we went through and what happened to us is, is, is so tragic. I would never want another parent to have to go through this pain. Yeah. Unfortunately, that probably won't ever happen. Mm -hmm. But we would like to limit the number of deaths and the kids that we're losing. And that's my goal. It was, it was very recent, too. Um, can you, have you heard anything from Dan and the package that we started the show with that resonates with you? about what you saw your son experience? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it was, it was about 10 months ago. I got a phone call. Uh, we were on vacation, and he had just basically come clean and said, Dad, I, I got hooked on heroin. And I told him that we loved him, and when we get home, we'll get you help. And, you know, the things that, that Jude was talking about, uh, you know, it started out with marijuana, started out with drinking alcohol. And those are just gateway drugs into something bigger, better, stronger to give you a more uh, higher high, so to speak. And so it, it, it's a prelude to getting into the heroin. And unfortunately, he lost his battle uh, August 12th of this year. Why? And, and this is, I'll open this up to all of you, if you jump in. Why is this so popular with young people, do you think? Why this drug? You still there, Casey? Yes, I see our mute button. If I could just unmute myself right there. There we go. The question was to any of you, to feel free to jump in. Why is this popular? Why heroin with our kids? Oh, I, I'd be open. Oh. <laughs> go go ahead. ahead, Brene. Uh, I, I, my comment would be, um, as Joe mentioned and as Jude has mentioned, that far more youth are using alcohol and marijuana and tobacco and other other drugs but because of the severe consequences of heroin um, that's what's grabbed the community's attention then having said that I guess I feel like there are three primary reasons why the youth are using them first um, as was also already mentioned the youth are starting to use the gateway drugs at a far earlier point so they're 11 12 and 13 years old meaning by the time they get to high school and college then they're more apt to be ready to try another type of a drug, whether that be heroin or something else. Second reason is that the opiates 
uh, whether it's prescription pain pills or heroin in powder form is so incredibly available and affordable to our youth. And then a third reason is simply that teens don't understand how highly addictive heroin is. I'd like to add to that. I think the other thing that's critical to understand about heroin is it's easily gotten, it's cheaper than prescription drugs, and um, it is uh, a better high from what we understand. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very appealing alternative. A more, a more efficient high in a lot of ways. What, yes. Where, where, do they, where, where do they get it? Where, where are our kids getting this drug? They're getting it from friends at parties, uh, uh, hooking up with older people, I think, and the dealers are getting involved in. Uh, it's very readily available. Uh, you know, we'll go back to what they were all talking about, to where, you know, my son's comment was uh, during his 90-day clean period before he passed, he was asked, why'd you do it? He said, well, I didn't think once would hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, once does hurt. And that's the message we have to get out to people. And they have to understand, you do this once or twice. And it's, it's like my son was given a death sentence, basically. Does that resonate with you ladies? Once, is once that dangerous? I think it depends on the individual, but heroin is a highly addictive drug. And um, because there's no way to verify the purity of the drug, you don't know the dosage that you're getting. And it's been demonstrated to be far more, it's far easier to become addicted to heroin than other kinds. And back to the purity thing mm -hmm. she was mentioning, back in the 70s, heroin was 4 to 7% pure. Now we're looking at anywhere between 90% pure and what's on the street today is 30 to 40 percent pure so you really don't know what you're getting mm -hmm. and, and these people when they're getting their first or second shot they're not getting enough okay so when they go back to have to get more because they want that more of a high that's when they're getting hit with higher doses and this is what's killing our kids and renee there's no way to know i I've, I've understand it with conversations with dan and other folks that mm -hmm. they don't get the same thing every time so if, if x amount worked for a, a, a good high, if you will, if there is, if that's appropriate to say, uh, the next time that same physical amount may kill them. Is that, is that? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. And, 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 and as Joe mentioned, it's a much different drug, as Dan mentioned, it's a much different drug than the, the black tar we used to hear about from decades ago. Yes. Uh, the kids feel it's safer because it's white, it's a powder, and they've already uh, started with the prescription medications many times. They think those are doctor prescribed. How bad can they be? Highly addictive. They affect your brain differently. And so, yes. And, and again, the potency, the purity, they don't know what they're getting. Nobody does. Renee, uh, Sally, thank you for your work. Joe, thank you for your, uh, for your story and for your courage to be here tonight. Uh, thank we, you. We appreciate you. all of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move any farther forward in this conversation, we want to offer a little ray of hope here. I'd like to introduce you to a man named Eugene. Oh, these were the worst steps. These were the worst steps. But now you can tell they're definitely solid and uh, with little details like the rubber mats. <laughs> we're very grateful for that. <laughs> but Eugene was, uh, Staten no is proud of the work that no he's put into rebuilding sure this house on the city's north side. It's owned by a friend, and before they got their hands on it, it was completely uninhabitable. We worked on this dilapidated building and turned it into turn it from an eyesore into something that people would take pride in staying at. Okay. And I stay here, I rent rooms, I help him rent the rooms. I do uh, viewing appointments throughout the day. So it's a community kitchen? Community kitchen. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, it stays clean like this all the time. I make sure of it. It's not a big deal, um, really, that Eugene keeps a clean cabinetry. kitchen. It's that he has a kitchen, food, and a place he takes pride in that could make headlines. 90% of this food in this fridge is mine. Because it wasn't that long ago Eugene was homeless and living in a park. Wow, but it really sucked. 
sleeping out here. Right there is where I slept. Eugene ended up here because he lost his job, his house, his family. Not to a down economy, but to his heroin addiction. Uh, what's going through my mind is I'm going to be the person that does everything that America asks you to do, and I'm going to get high doing it. Eugene was naive because he succeeded in everything. In high school, he was an honor student and an athlete, and he did it all while using drugs. I went to the Parkway School District, and so the reality of it at that time is, and excuse me if this sounds crazy, I got some of the best drugs that money could buy because there was a lot of money out there. Despite his addiction, Eugene managed to graduate from college, marry his longtime girlfriend, have a daughter, and a blossoming career as an employment counselor at a local college. But addiction got in the way, and the Eugene that was once good at everything began to disappear when heroin became the most important thing in his life. I lost that job due to my active addiction. And I think that was the, the first domino that knocked down the rest of them that made me come to terms with the fact that this is just not going to be pull offable. Eugene was losing his battle to heroin, which was re-emphasized when after being hospitalized for dope sickness, his wife left him and took their daughter with her. The, the life that I knew it had changed. She was done. You know, she had prayed about it. She, she, God gave her the, the gumption to walk away and, and not feel bad about it. You know, and there, and there, I, there I stood, you know. So the bottom finally dropped out when she left? Yeah. But uh, that's still, you know, might as well be inside a jail cell. I know. Now mm. homeless, Eugene had one purpose, to get high an addiction that cost anywhere from 30 to $150 a day. And every morning I would wake up and I would be sick, you know, dope sick from the heroin. And uh, so I would wake up, I would canvas the neighborhood, you know, to go try to steal a lawnmower, to go pine it, to go sell it, you know, or go do whatever I needed to do that would end, where the end result would be some cash in my hand to go you know, buy some more heroin. Heroin led Eugene to a lifestyle of crime just to sustain his addiction. Until one day this past May, he was accepted into a treatment program at the Salvation Army. Treatment which included receiving Vivitrol once a month, an injection that prevents addiction relapse. This is his sixth Vivitrol injection. It stops his cravings for drugs or alcohol, and he has been doing really well on it, uh, that he has not tried to use, he has not slipped or relapsed or anything. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Ready as you'll ever be, huh, Eugene? Loosen up for me, hon. Okay? I'm trying. Okay. It's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Short-term pain. Long-time gain. Right. The shot that I get is I, I, uh, I emphasize the fact that it's only one component of, of uh, my recovery process. It's a shot that assists me in my treatment. It's medically-assisted wow. treatment because if you just do the shot and nothing else, you likely to go back to where you just came from. The shot is no magic wand. You know, you have to uh, do, have to incorporate everything. The self-help groups, the uh, the counseling, both individual and group. Oh, what's up, dog? Hey, what's up, Eugene? How's it going, man? What's up, what's up, what's up man? Uh, same After thing. fighting addiction for most of his life, Eugene is six months clean. And while he knows this is something he will struggle with for the rest of his life, he is grateful. <laughs> right. Do you realize how lucky you are? I'm blessed, you know. Luck comes with Powerball. I'm blessed. We now want to go back to Google Plus uh, to talk to our friends uh, from the north. The folks in Chicago have been dealing with this issue uh, on a larger scale for a longer time. So allow me to introduce you to, this is Kelly McCutcheon. She is a student, but she is also an accomplished filmmaker uh, on this topic. She has a film that uh, really a lot of people are singing the praises of. 
uh, that deals with her high school and the topic of heroin in a very frank way. This uh, lady you're looking at here now is Kathy Kane Willis from Roosevelt University. Kathy has uh, been researching the heroin epidemic for a decade or more, I believe. Is that correct, Kathy? Since 2004. 2004. So, and the other gentleman joining us is from the Chicago Tribune, John Kielman. Uh, has covered this topic extensively in Chicago. So before we talk about perhaps what we can learn from the experiences in Chicago, first set the stage for us. Uh, how long has this been a problem in Chicago? Joe, I'll, I'll start with you and, and anyone else feel free to jump in. It's been a, a problem in Chicago since, uh, you know, for decades. Um, I think it's what's changed in the last 10 to 15 years is that uh, a whole new demographic has begun to abuse this and that's uh, younger people from the suburbs. I would say the changing demographic is what's gotten uh, all of the attention and it's 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 um, you know the young white suburban heroin users that's really you know gaining a lot of attention and, and we see that pattern since 2000. Uh, John, I may have uh, introduced you as Joe. I apologize. That's John from the Tribune. Uh, uh, Kelly, um, let's go to you for a second. Uh, you made a <laughs> film where you had some very frank and honest and open discussions with your uh, then high school classmates. You're in college now. Why did you mm -hmm. want to make that film? Um, because I noticed that there was like um, this heroin epidemic going on at my school and um, there was a lot of like rumors and false information that was going on about it and I wanted it to like come straight up from the kids talking about what was actually going on and what they were actually doing and things like that. Before we go ahead let's take a look at this actually we have a clip from your film uh, Nequa was the name of your high school Nequa on drugs let's let's take mm -hmm. a look at that. I feel like it's just too much time and too much money in Naperville. It, everybody's like too okay with heroin. Um, kids at Nequa, they just get f***ed up to the point of like no return. Drugs have been around forever, it's nothing new. I mean, people die of drugs every day. It just f***ing swept me away, man. It was the greatest high I had ever felt. Get this feeling that, hey, maybe heroin's not that bad. Obviously, you know, we never have any idea, you know, of what is uh, about to happen. All these kids that have passed away at Nequa and have died, but that, that doesn't happen anywhere else. Kathy, you've spent a lot of time researching this topic. When you saw this film, how did it strike you? Am I still on? Yes, uh, yes. Okay, I can't see the screen that I'm on. Oh, so we, I'm can see, we can see you if you don't mind. Go, tell, I don't, you have seen uh, Kelly's film, I know. Talk, what was your reaction the, to those conversations? I thought the film was unbelievably truthful and uh, something that everyone needs to see. I think that... Um, I think that parents don't understand how kids process how um, how kids process the drug taking experience, and I don't think that there is enough distinction made between you know um, between drugs. So I mean, when you have a system that sort of when then there's very little drug education and. Um, marijuana is sort of treated the same as all other drugs. I mean, that's what I think is really evident in the film and, and how difficult and stressful it is to be around all of these drugs and uh, to watch people around you die, the grief process. The reason why people are, are using hard drugs, I don't think is because they are looking, you know, there's this perception that they're looking for this, this bigger, better high. I think a lot of it is the reason why people use uh, strong painkillers is to kill pain. And I think that's what Kelly's film really demonstrates so significantly. Well, Kelly, let's ask that question to you. Why, why are kids on heroin? Um, I mean, like, I'm not uh, the like person to really ask that question, um, okay, but like, fair enough. I mean, I, I can. There's just like different reasons. I don't know why like every kid does heroin. You well, know. Well, what did I you mean, want just, parents? What did you want adults, if you will, to use that term? Uh, what, what did you want people to know from this film, from your perspective, when you made it? Um, I mean, I just wanted them to know like a lot of things. Like I wanted them to know like different things about rehab and just like drugs and like, um, I don't know, just like 
whatever we talked about in the film, there's just like uh -oh. different things that people needed to know and stuff. Uh, John, let me um, go back to you for a second. The, um, do you, do you s tell us about something called the Good Samaritan Law? I have you covered this in your reporting and what and enlighten us about this because it's something that uh, exists in your state and not in ours. Well, Kathy's certainly the expert on that, but um, what it is essentially is that uh, there is a long-standing problem with people um, who overdose that their companions will not uh, call 911 because they are worried that they are going to get arrested for drug possession when the cops and paramedics show up. So what the Good Samaritan Law does is gives them a limited amount of immunity uh, with the hope that they won't uh, be too scared to call the police if their friend starts, uh, you know, stops breathing. There's some layers to that uh, that I was going to ask Kathy about, but we, we just lost her there, so I apologize. Um, it, it, what has been done in Chicago, John? That, what can we learn from you? What has Chicago done that, that we can take away from? Um, is there is there light at the end of the I'm tunnel? Sorry. I mean, have you seen some things work? And Kathy, you're you're back with us. I, the, yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. The question I, is, what is Chicago? Where have you seen success that we need to know about here? Absolutely. There's one thing. The Good Samaritan Law was just went into effect in June, and so we're still working on the implementation. We do. We have had anecdotal reports of a couple of lives being saved. The one thing that you do not have that Chicago does have. Um, in the St. Louis area, area is naloxone distribution. That's Narcan distribution. Narcan has saved over 3,000 lives. Um, Narcan is like an EpiPen except for overdoses. Um, it just removes this all of the- This is something that in Missouri paramedics have access to if they Absolutely. arrive on the scene. But the American Medical Association and even the drug czar's office have come out in favor of having people trained in naloxone, Narcan, um, and, and having it available at home for prescription pills and for heroin, for all of these things, because the reality is no one, no one should die from an from a opioid overdose because they are 100 percent preventable. So um, I think that it's really important to be able to get those resources out into the community. And I do think it's important to couple that with a Good Samaritan law. Thank we you. know that the reason why people do not call 911 is the fear of police involvement. Thank but you. I do Thank think you. there's a couple of things that you're doing. I'm, oh. I'm, sorry to, okay. I'm sorry to cut you off. We'll come back to that point. I thank you all for your time and we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you very much. mentioned the uh, the Good Samaritan law there the idea of having that pen is not without a little controversy I was talking to uh, Joe the man who lost his son and, and he, he actually had some concerns about that about that might uh, actually make kids take chances more oh my friends got the pen I can do this then uh, Kelly responded that she thought that was uh, the kids are not thinking that way they're not really processing things like that but I, ju I just want to mention that that's not without controversy, but I, I want to I know what's piquing your interest so far. We were just talking about that, just that whole Narcan distribution. I, it conjures up the image in, in Pulp Fiction yeah. of, you know, just bringing somebody <laughs> back to life. Yeah. And I, I can see that it just seems that kids might take risks because it's a cool image to, to conjure up. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and Joe, Joe described it. Uh, that's, again, Joe is the gentleman who lost his son, uh, God love him, just a couple of months ago. Uh, so I still can't get over his strength to be here tonight. But, mm -hmm. you know, he, was, he, he referred to it as Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. it, that, I don't know. Does that concern you guys? I mean, is that popping your interest? Well, two things that resonate with me were like, uh, what are the signs of someone who's on drugs? And then how do we as a community support people that are on drugs? Because it seems like you know we have this whole thing of the war on drugs, and that you know war metaphors and drugs doesn't seem very popular. You know, 
positive. I think we need to sort of change the paradigm we have around people on drugs. Instead of sending them, you know, you talk about this, instead of sending them to jail or prison, we need to give them you know, rehab and talk to them about why they should not be on them and support them getting off of it. As far as identifying people who are on drugs, as far as trying to like help, help find them before addiction takes over their lives, I think, I mean, Eugene's story earlier just speaks to how difficult that really has to be because by all accounts, he was, he was a good athlete, he was a good student, he was a good person. Oh, but also, he's on heroin. He, he uses this also. And you wouldn't have known that initially. That happens with a lot of people. You can't, you can't tell that right away, and there's a lot of people who fool themselves into thinking, no, I'm not addicted, no, it's not, it's not a problem, I could stop any time I wanted. Trying to identify them has to be incredibly difficult. You know, I don't know, I don't know Eugene, but I wonder if we could have seen signs that indicated that he was on drugs and how we could have helped him before it got to the point that he's currently in right now. Right. And similarly, yeah. we talk about parents. Definitely, it, it's the onus is upon parents to identify and make sure that they know what's going on in their children's lives. But in the school district, so he specifically said in, in the Parkway School District, he had access to the best drugs money can buy. And so there's so much pressure on teachers to do so many other things, but what can we do at the administrative level and the teaching level to, to help identify? All good questions, guys. We've got a lot of information to cover tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, the night's getting away from us and we want to talk about what we can do about this. So let's go back to another hangout tonight. We have with us CJ Strom. CJ uh, is a counselor, works with uh, folks dealing with this. And CJ, I'll put it out there, you yourself have dealt with this drug too. Uh, Ed McCann organizes rallies. We've seen more and more of those popping up, people trying to get out the word in communities that didn't otherwise maybe know that there was a heroin problem. And Ned Presnell is also a counselor and a social worker. Um, gentlemen, let me open up, open up the conversation to all of you. What, what is being done now that you are seeing that, that works to, to, to kind of head this off and reverse this trend? Um, I think the thing that works and that has, has always worked, although we have new tools for it now, is uh, individualized, integrated, and long-term treatment. I mean, we're dealing with a chronic illness here that, you know, uh, when people come to treatment, there's a one in four chance that they've already been to treatment five or more times if they're coming for heroin addiction. Um, and so what we find is treatment tends to be episodic. A lot of times um, there's kind of these silo approaches where um, treatment agencies aren't using all the tools that are available to help people get and to stay well. Um, and then additionally, and this is across the culture, whether it's a treatment provider, a patient, um, or just someone in the community, when someone starts to do well, there's pressure on them to stop doing some of the things that they were doing to get well, like taking the medications that were working. And we don't do that for any other chronic illness, but when people start to get well with addiction, there's a lot of um, kind of bias towards, well, maybe they're cured now and they can just go on and forget about it. And that doesn't tend to work. CJ, you're, from your personal experience, on really both sides of this, what should, we, what should we be doing? Well, I think we should be doing a lot of the stuff that we're doing now. I think that, you know, at uh, the, the agency that I work for, we try to provide as best we can wraparound treatment services for folks. And we do utilize medicated assisted treatment. Uh, we utilize all different forms of treatment. I was talking earlier with Ned and we were talking about there's no one way that works for everyone. If there was, we would actually do that. And I think what we attempt to do as best we can is provide individualized treatment services to people. And we try and utilize as many different techniques and tools uh, that we can in order to provide someone the stability that they need to really address the problems uh, not only of the drug addiction that they have, but the underlying issues that may have directed them towards uh, drug use or alcohol use as a relief system. Ed, obviously awareness is a big part of this in terms of the community has to know there's a problem before uh, it can tackle it. You, you've organized rallies. Do you see the tide starting to shift in terms of people knowing that there is a problem, Ed? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it makes a difference. We have rallied so far just in the St. Louis area about 70 times in cities all around the community. 
75 miles north, south, east, and west. Um, and we do it in force. Many of the rallies, there's one coming up this Saturday in Washington, Missouri. We have 600 people signed up. The communities are really getting on board. We rallied a couple weeks ago in Wentzville with the mayor of Wentzville. Uh, we've done uh, rallies in, in South County area, Jefferson County, um, with state representatives. I mean, the community is really getting on board with this, and that's what's important to us, is to get the message out there. Heroin is in your communities. It's taking your kids. And let's do something about it. Let's come together as a community. And we work very hard on that. We're even going national right now. We'll leave it on that note for now. I thank you all for your time. Good information. Also, a lot of good information here at the Nine Network on Monday night in that town hall we mentioned earlier. Here's a little sample of what we learned on Monday night. I think it's, there, it's been dumped into our community. There just seems to be so much now. Do you know that you can get a button of heroin for $5 less than a six pack nowadays? It's cheap, it's plentiful. 48 to 72 hours of usage, you can have a physiological addiction. We're kind of wired to think that it's not gonna happen to us. A member of your family's got a, an addiction to heroin. It's a horrible word to have to speak. Take away some of the stigma that's associated with heroin. So people are talking about it's like an elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it's out there now. About 80% of our shoplifting arrests are people that are addicted to some sort of illegal narcotic. Um, and now we're talking about prescription pills, and that's where it starts. And almost everybody's medicine cabinet has Vicodin or something. As a parent, now I look back, I saw all the signs. And when you come together as a community to address something that's damaging your community, then it doesn't make any difference whether it's rural or urban. It's just about coming together as a community and addressing what the problem is. This is a conversation with a, that takes a lot of different directions. Here to help us make sense of it all, Ted Cicero from Washington University. Um, help us out here, first of all. What, what's standing out to you tonight? If we, what, is there something we've missed in a big way that you want to make sure people know about? Yeah, I think the biggest thing we've missed is, is really why people are taking these drugs. We've, we've talked about that they're starting at a very early age with right. marijuana, alcohol, and then moving on to other drugs. Uh, I think we have to look back at the, the whole way this started was back in the 90s. There was an emphasis in this country on the treatment of pain. And all of a sudden, opiate analgesics became uh, readily available and used uh, quite frequently pain, by doctors. Pain pills. We pain pills. Prescription pain, pills. pain medicine. And the more pain pills prescribed, the more leakage there was out into the community. People stealing out of the medicine cabinets, taking their parents' uh, medications, whatever. This, the logic behind it, if you talk to these kids, and we, we interview about 1,000 uh, people a month, is, or I'm sorry, a quarter as part of our studies. If you talk to them, uh, why do you take these prescription opioids? Well, they make me feel good, and they're perfectly safe. They're not heroin. They come in pill forms that are easily identifiable. They've got numbers on them. I know what the dose is, so it's very safe for me. So the logic was impeccable, actually, that if I take these drugs, they're safe to take because I know what I'm getting. With heroin, I don't know what I'm getting. So if that's a dangerous thing, I won't do. So they began taking prescription opioids, and this went on for a period now of 15 or 20 years, uh, but reached a point where uh, it wasn't enough anymore. As we got up to oxycodone and much more powerful drugs, they became very expensive, up to $80 for a, a pill. A pill. Uh, up to $80 when you had heroin down at $10. Uh, 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 quite inexpensive. At a, more, at a higher potency. Much higher potency. And uh, the... So they make that transition. And, and as we've heard tonight, they don't, no one starts out on heroin saying, I, no. think, I think I may put a, a belt around my arm and a needle in my arm. No. Th th that's not how it goes. But, it, but they do get to that point. They do get to the point. They start out initially snorting is, is the most uh, acceptable means of doing it. It's just like cocaine, you just snort the uh, heroin. It's very pure at this point because dealers are businessmen and they've had to price the heroin at a low enough price and with a high enough purity that they'll have their customers coming back. So you have this, this uh, nefarious thing going on where oxycodone prices and uh, pain analgesic prices were rising dramatically. Heroin was decreasing and it was getting pure. It was sort of the perfect storm at this point for kids to say, well, I'm gonna try it just to snort it because I don't have to inject it. I can just snort it or I can smoke it and I'll get a high. I hate to ask you in 60 seconds to tell right. us what we, or what we should do going from forward, but in 60 seconds, what, what should we do going forward? We've got to start educating kids and, and I think some of the reasons kids take these drugs we have to recognize. Uh, they have self-esteem issues very often, they have anxiety levels, they have depression, and these drugs make them feel better. 
And a lot of kids we talk to basically say, I feel normal when I'm on these medications. I think what we need to start to do is not so much focus on the supply side, but on the demand side. To look at these kids and say, what is the demand? Why are you using these drugs? Are you using them inappropriately? And if so, we have to gear all of our prevention and intervention uh, techniques to stopping that demand. Our country has taken too long a policy that if we stop the supply of drugs, we'll decrease demand. That hasn't worked. It never has worked and it never will work until we work on the, 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 the demand, demand side, side, reduce that amount. Dr. Ted Cicero from Washington University, thank you for your time. We appreciate thank you. your perspective. Thank, thank you, you very much. You know, Casey, one of the things that we saw a great deal tonight on Twitter and on Facebook was that uh, heroin is cheaper than a six pack. And this idea of the Good Samaritan law, that that's something that we, that Missouri can make some progress if we actually uh, pass that legislation. We also talked about the fact that, uh, <laughs> I think one thing I've heard tonight is we, we talked on Monday night and we've talked tonight mm -hmm. and there's a lot more to still talk about. Lots more to talk about. And we plan to continue to do that. Until then, we'd like to show you what we'll be talking about here on Stay Tuned next week. Next Thursday on Stay Tuned, how can we be sure our schools are making the grade? There are many ways to measure, but the state of Missouri gives a district its stamp of approval through accreditation. Chances are you've heard of it, but what is it? How can accreditation affect not just a school, but your neighborhood, family, and community, even if you're in the best district in the state? Stay tuned.